Your fear of capture and imprisonment is an implant from millions of years ago. Your spirit was free, moving from body to the next body. Free, free for a moment. And then it was captured by an invader force bent on turning you to the darkest way. You've been implanted with a push-pull mechanism that keeps you fearful of authority and destructive. We are in the middle of a battle that's a trillion years in the making, and it's bigger than the both You're of us. We're making this shit up. That's Philip Seymour Hoffman and Joaquin Phoenix from the movie The Master, which is kind of loosely based on the life of L. Ron Hubbard, which is a topic that we certainly talk about today in this interview with, gosh, just a great, great researcher and writer, author, Philip Fairbanks. Here's one of many clips I wanted to share with you. Like you're saying with, with Elrond, you know, he not only gets the girl, then he says, yeah, you know, this strange boat deal. Like, oh, we're going to go to Miami and buy a boat and then sail it back here to California and we'll make a lot of money and we'll split it. All we need you to do is put up all the money and give us a free boat to get the other boat with. Like, what? So that's and that's literally after. But this is with Marjorie, Marjorie Cameron, the his ex. Like, I almost have to respect Elrond occasionally because he comes from that, like, larger than life P.T. Barnum huckster tradition that's so quintessentially American. You know, what's more American than P.T. Barnum? Like, you know what? I'm going to take a bunch of rubes for their money. It's just so insane. Like, they were going to do a sex ritual out in the desert. And they did. I think this is how he stole his girlfriend, I think, because like initially Jack Parsons was going to have sex with his girlfriend. He's like, wait, Jack, <laughs> maybe, maybe <laughs> I can have sex with your girlfriend and you could be the one who's like watching us and saying the stuff. You could be reciting stuff <laughs> while I'm having sex with your girlfriend, who we will later embezzle from you. You actually jump to the next bracketed reality beyond that, which is the spiritual. So when he does go out and perform these rites and rituals under the direction of Crowley, right? Because Crowley is in mm -hmm. communication with Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons, Parsons reaches out yeah. to Crowley and says, I'm your number one guy. I want to be your number one agent yeah. in, and uh, you know, uh, Crowley, from all accounts, has a little bit of that huckster in him, too. Oh, absolutely, you know? yeah. And, and and he loved Jack, apparently. I think that the, that relationship ruined it. Uh, because when he saw, he's like, no, 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 that's what you do to the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't believe in that stuff. You get the other guy to believe and you take his girlfriend and his money and his boat. And that's woo that's the <laughs> trick. So I know I usually just have one clip in these shows, but I think I might have to start doing more, particularly when you got a guy like Phil Fairbanks who is just willing to go a lot of places that not everybody's willing to go. Culture is downstream of religion. Religion shapes the culture, which shapes the society, which shapes the individual. Even if it's just good for me and a few hundred million others on earth, I think it's worthwhile thing. Until we understand some of that spiritual stuff, until we're willing mm -hmm. to go there, because the first step we have to go is, okay, psychology is bullshit. It's been engineered to promote a certain viewpoint. And then we look at the political, which is where you're willing to take us. Is this a brown stomach operation? Is it a human compromise operation? Yes, it is. But then the mm -hmm. third layer is, is it evil in some way that we don't normally talk about? I almost hint to that in the first chapter where I talk about like the Cleveland Street scandal and Lewis Carroll, the author of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and uh, talk about J.M. Barry, the author of Peter Pan, uh, which sadly, you know, for anybody who wasn't aware, sadly, they are both most likely pedophiles. <laughs> So one of the topics Phil and I talked a bit about is MK Ultra, and in particular, how it rolls into Project Stargate. I know I return to this topic a lot, but I really think it's important to understand this history because it does seem to be under a rewrite. 
And the interesting thing about Philip Fairbanks is he has been on the MK Ultra stuff longer than anyone I can think of. I mean, like almost 20 years. So the amount of information he's amassed, the amount of documents that he has, if you really drill into his work, I mean, he has documents and stuff that he's got, FOIA requests, stuff that he's just found squirreled away. So He's really a pro, and it was great to talk to him about that. Even as horrific as it is, it's something I think we have to face. Canada's Mengele, you know, is what they say. Yeah, it, it just like yeah. Gottlieb is Gottlieb is our Mengele. But yep, as you've documented, the kinds of experiments that they were doing on people are more than just the what's become the kind of cartoon trope. Bo, they gave them LSD at a party yeah. when they didn't know about it. Oh, right. they were yeah. so bad. No, man, they were chaining kids down in beds and not letting them move. And, and, and sensory deprivation stuff. And, you know, you're not allowed to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and breaking people and, and breaking people and intentionally and, and the, breaking the enormous people. amount of people who would become famous later. And whether it's guys like Ken Kesey and Leonard Cohen or whether it's guys like Charles Manson and Ted Kaczynski, because all of them famously had close ties with at least, you know, some element of MK. The reason I bring up immediately Stargate, just so people understand this, you know all this stuff backwards and forwards, so I'm not telling you, but L. Ron Hubbard has, starts Scientology, so he, whatever blend it is of this, kind of satanic, spiritual, occulted, real connection with these extended realms, and also his kind of pragmatic hucksterism, good old American hucksterism, how can I rip everyone off? He starts Scientology, and lo and behold, because there is this military connection, as you described, military intelligence is, hey, whatever works. You know what I mean? You want to yeah. call it Satan, you yeah. want to go, we don't care. We just want to conquer yeah. that hill. And to a certain extent, that has to always be the job of the military and in a way that we don't understand because you're not inside that culture but what they'll tell you is hey we've been through this for thousands of years and i'll tell you at the end of the day phil when it's me defending you you don't give a fuck whether i have satan tattooed on my back or not you just want me to keep those motherfuckers from coming through your front door okay one last clip maybe one of my favorites because for me until you get to the spiritual, you really ain't talking about anything. So when I get a guest who is super well-versed in all these conspiracy topics and really parapolitical history topics, but then is willing to go next level spiritual, and it's exciting. And he wraps it all up with this final clip. Is he, is he taking this stuff as a joke or something? Like, no, I've got kind of a supercilious expression half the time. Because if I didn't, I would go crazy because things are so heavy, you know, things are really heavy. And that's no reason to let yourself get dragged down by them. One of the tricks of the powers that be is demoralization and depression, because you're not going to be on top of things. You're not going to change anything in your own life or outside of your own life if you're demoralized and depressed. So this is a long interview, longer than most of the ones I do. And that's part of the reason I shared so many clips to maybe motivate you to stick around. If you do stick around, if you listen to it and you enjoy it, please share it. This is one that I really hope gets out there far and wide. Stick around for my interview with Philip Fairbanks. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Karras, and today we welcome Philip Fairbanks to Skeptico. Phil is a writer, researcher. He's the author of Pedogate Primer, The Politics of Pedophilia. And he's also the author of the forthcoming Deep State Penetrating the Veils of the Unelected Shadow Government. Phil, it's awesome. I've heard you on some great shows. And then we recently saw each other on the Union of the Unwanted podcast. Oh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. It was. And uh, you have some great, great stuff. So it's great to have you on. I'm super excited to talk about all this stuff at a kind of... Same here, yeah. Yeah, great. 
And and I like that, you know, what my goal here or my plan is to kind of dispense with the level one stuff, which I always call it, and kind of jump right. into some of the deeper waters. Because, oh, for sure, yeah. So, so let's start right out, you know, uh, like there's so much about your background. So I've heard a lot about your background, you live in Manila, you mm -hmm. started writing at a very young age and all this stuff. Right. But there's yeah. some other cool stuff about your background <laughs> that I don't even know where we're going to go. Tennessee and Protestant evangelical <laughs> uh, exorcisms like I saw. <laughs> Did you see that? Yeah, uh, uh, it was uh, it was uh, it was around the Halloween you know, it was the spooky season. And, and, uh, I don't know, I was thinking back to, you know, I, I definitely got a lot of, uh, crazy stories in my past. And, uh, that was, that was definitely one of them, like a genuine Protestant exorcism. Not everybody gets to experience one of those. So when I got the chance, I made sure to take them up on the offer. <laughs> so I'm referring to an article blog post on Phil's website titled, the protestant exorcism a true story and maybe you can tell a little bit about the story because it's kind of funny but also what yeah, that means yeah. about your your background you know i mean you're mm -hmm. a kid you're growing up there's a lot of stuff tennessee very interesting interesting tennessee is interesting it's interesting from this oh, paranormal yeah. standpoint man so go ahead well, for one thing, uh, talking about the, the background and how I was raised, uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, I came from kind of a uh, somewhat strict kind of fundamentalist uh, upbringing, you know, homeschooled until fifth grade. Granddad was a, a Southern Baptist preacher and, you know, and that definitely uh, shaped a lot of, uh, you know, who I am and whatnot. Then I'd say probably in my teens, I started, you know, uh, you know, kind of getting interested in some other things, especially a lot of the stuff that was considered taboo when I was growing up, you know, and, and that would include like pretty much anything that paranormal or, or, you know, uh, anything to do with psi or ESB or UFOs or any of that kind of stuff was all, you know, part of the, the new age conspiracy, because, you know, I kind of grew up during the, the satanic panic era where you know heavy metal and and dungeons and dragons and 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 magic the gathering and all that kind of stuff you know star wars and star trek you know uh and and to to be fair you know when i look back at a lot of that stuff now you know i think it's silly to say that it's you know necessarily watching star trek the next generation isn't going to you know endanger your immortal soul but it is like when you look at it it's kind of you know UN approved neoliberal programming, which, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about in, in email is, is uh, like the Stargate, the CIA and military Stargate, you know, uh, Gene Roddenberry was connected to some of that weird stuff at SRI with a lot of these, you know, uh, old money, rich families. And, and, you know, the, a lot of them are really interested in UFOs and Psy, you know, the Bronfins who are tied to Nexium and all this kind of stuff. But yeah, as far as the, uh, the exorcism story, yeah. Let me kind of pause you there for a second. Cause oh, there's yeah, some, yeah. well, there's just some different pieces that you've laid out that I think I want to make mm. sure people get, you know, is right. so like this period where you're growing up in and kind of the strict, you know, homeschooling christian mm. fundamentalist kind of thing and then the rebellious teenager you know you're doing drugs yeah, out yeah. in the woods with and your friends in my 20s and yeah yeah and all uh -huh. that stuff and and that's a story that gets repeated over and over again and you know oh, one yeah of the, yeah one of the things we might explore and throw out here is to what extent uh, Christianity plays into that because mm -hmm. then we see the, you know, sin and redemption and the way it's oh, played yeah, out. Because yeah. I've it, seen it, other people, you know, like, you know, multiple people have a similar story where maybe they had a, a Christian uh, upbringing, then go through this rebellious period, end up, you know, experimenting with drugs and Crowley and Robert Anton, Anton Wilson and Leary and Lily and all this kind of stuff, and then have kind of a, you know, uh, you know, excuse the pun here, but have a come to Jesus moment where it's like, you know, actually what I was looking for, this, you know, this spirituality, this connection, it was there all along. And, you know, uh, as for me, yeah, that's, 
I, I don't know. It's like I kind of had a realization. I think uh, Philip K. Dick helped me a little bit with that. Uh, the science fiction author who is also maybe schizophrenic and uh, definitely a Gnostic. But like, you know, I was reading some of his stuff and uh, especially like it was like a speech he'd given and he was talking about Gnosticism and about how time is an illusion. It's all it's it sounds nutty. But at the same time, it was like, OK, metaphor or not, this makes sense. And like it, it had that that crazy, kooky, psychedelic element to it. But at the same time, it was it's Christianity at the same time. You know, the the this, you know, the this ancient warfare between good and evil, et cetera. So for me, it kind of kind of dovetailed back. I found and appreciated Christianity more the second time, maybe. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. I think I think a lot of people who, you know, I, I've seen this a lot with people who were raised in a church and then kind of, you know, it grows stale for them. And then other people who aren't raised with religion and then they find it as an adult and it's just, wow, they latch on to it. It's this new thing, you know? So I, I think I got kind of got a chance to experience that with my little prodigal trip. <laughs> well, th there's so much there and I can't resist kind of diving into the Christian thing because it's a big thing for me lately, especially when we're going to talk about cults and we're going to talk about yeah. all these different ways of mind control and stuff like that. And I, I just, I don't want to a priori leave Christianity off the table there because I think mm -hmm. that's where it belongs. I don't force anyone else to believe that, but I think historically, you know, the historical accounts of Jesus fall into the category of a Roman psyop, and I think the evidence of that, it's highly dependent on Josephus, and Josephus is clearly an agent for the Romans. And this is like the with, with Panthera and the idea that Mary was possibly, or is that related to any no, of that? No, no, it's really related to just, like, do you know, uh, we're going to go off on a, on a tangent here, but that's fine. Do you know who Josephus is? The historian, yeah, yeah. Yes. So uh, Josephus is the guy, he's in Judea, he's Jewish. Right, around the same and, time, and yeah. And he's a general, and uh, it, it, this is, most historians who are writing of this period are relying on the works of Josephus. The works of Josephus, mm -hmm. they'll admit, are flawed, because Josephus is... A proven liar. He's a proven liar in his own oh, works. Yeah. He, he claims to be the greatest Jewish, you know, teacher and knower and have completed all the wisdom traditions of his various three sects by the time he's 14. It just doesn't add up in a number of ways, right. the things that he's saying. Sounds like L. Ron Hubbard's background. I did everything by the time I was 14 and now I'm writing the book on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it's so many people, you know, James Randi also has that element, you know, oh, they, they gave yeah, me a special, you know? they gave me That's a special pass yeah. at the library because I was so <laughs> gifted and knowledgeable, but that's a totally, total other story. The thing about Josephus and people listen to this show all the time, kind of get tired of me hammering on it, but there's actually a, the quote that you can pull up and now I can't. I'm not going to pull up that quote. I always pull up the quote, but it's right out of Josephus's work. And it is when Vespasian, who is the Roman, he's will become the Roman emperor and he's vying for that Roman Caesar kind of position. And he right. uses Josephus. He turns Josephus. He comes and lands in Galilee and he defeats him in battle. And what I suspect happens contrary to the conventional conventional history is that Josephus and 40 men lock themselves in a cave or barricade themselves in a cave and they commence with committing suicide in this kind of round robin fashion until it gets down to just Josephus and this other guy and then wouldn't you know he has a revelation and he says you know what maybe we shouldn't do this and I'm going to turn myself in and uh the reason they had to do the round robin thing was because Jewish law said you can't kill yourself, but you kill again the kind of classic right, kind of okay, crazy. Okay, I got you. Yeah, yeah, like so very legalistic, but it's got to be just so. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So he goes to Vespasian, and now 
he has this, and, and this is the conventional history, which is something that's so interesting to me about history, how they can completely fly off in a different direction in terms of psychic precogni precognitive uh, of, of prophecy is okay at this part of history. And then in other places, you know, they wouldn't do it. I, I digress again, because what Josephus does, he goes to Vespasian, he goes, I have a vision, you are going to be Caesar. And he goes, what? He goes, yes, I have a vision. You're going to be Caesar. And he goes, keep this guy around. Don't cut off his head like we have everybody else somehow because he says this, which is a completely absurd idea. But we let those things slip through history because they get repeated over and over again. What really happened with Josephus is Josephus knew where the fucking gold and silver was buried at the temple. And he cut a deal with Vespasian and said, look, kill me and you'll never get to it because look at the Dead Sea Scrolls of today and it's a treasure map and it says, right. go 200 feet from this, 40 feet down, here's a, so that's what really happens. This is the original PSYOP. So then he becomes the historian, the Roman historian, he writes this history, but Phil, and again, this is like one of the most important stories that no one knows about. He winds up writing War of the Jews, which becomes this kind of fundamental book for all Christian scholars up to this point. And in this book, he actually says, you know, one of the things, he's writing what he claims to be history, and he's, he's writing it, we can't read it with, the, with all, everything that we know now. We have to read it as if it was at the time he was writing it, because at the time he was writing it, he was trying to influence people. He was trying to do an operation. And what he says in his writing is, you know, what's wrong with these Jews, and he's a Jew, is that they, in their all their books, they had read that the Messiah was going to come from the soil of Israel. And what they didn't realize is this Bayesian was on the soil of Israel when he became emperor. So, hey, you're laughing because you get it. This is so yeah. obvious. Obviously, this is like a, a and, and when I talk to people, I've talked to a bunch of pretty valid historians, PhDs and stuff, and they go, yeah, but it didn't it didn't work or that was a silly psyop. It's like, no, you, you can't oh, say no, that. No, that's that's that that was what I, I loved about the Philip K. Dick thing, because it's the, the idea that the Roman Empire never died. It just pretended to be the Holy Roman Empire. It's like uh, all of a sudden it's you know, it's the same folks and it's the same, you know, right down to the, the all the trappings of, you know, a lot of what we consider, you know, uh, essential to Christianity was shaped by pagan traditions from where, you know, we go, we, we go further and further out west and we pick up all these pagan traditions wherever we stop and we add those to Christianity because it's like, a, uh, it's, it's like a layout. It fits right over, you know, uh, the, the pagan landscape, almost one-to-one -one, uh, kind of relationship totally so what are we to make of jesus that's the question that's the question as it relates to all this stuff that we're going to talk about it's as it relates to satanism as it relates to west memphis three you know right, right there and was west memphis arkansas but it, you know it's the kids walking around with the satanic panic shirts on and the rock and roll bands and all that stuff and everyone going oh that's just ridiculous and then people the christians saying no that's satan and look right here in my bible how do we resolve those two extremes that we're gonna have to find some resolution for but if the historical Jesus doesn't hold up, and I would maintain, I'm sorry for the long, long story, <laughs> historical Jesus doesn't hold up. What does hold up is Christ consciousness that in some way we don't understand. You can connect with some divinity, and that may connect with or under, you may understand it to be Jesus, it may present itself to be Jesus, who cares? The point is, it's going to try and lead you towards the light, and there's this other force that's going to try and lead right. you towards the dark. And it, it, I think we need to sort that out a little bit better than we have been if we're really going to get to the bottom of this.
What what? But do, I'm really jumping into the deep waters. But are well, are you, you with know, me on this? As as far as the idea of you know even religion as a whole being a psyop to some extent, I think that it's possible to be religious and to also agree that yes, on the whole, if you just take history, you know, just look at history and see it uh, as it's shaped down down the millennia through uh, eon to eon. Yes, absolutely. Religion and culture, you know, uh, culture is downstream of religion. You know, religion shapes the culture, which shapes the society, which shapes the individual. And uh, and as a result, and I think there is something to religion. Though I also believe that even if it's just good for me, like one of the one of the questions in your, you know, even if it's just good for me and a few hundred million others on Earth, I think it's worthwhile thing, you know. And and I also technically believe I think that religion can be good for you, regardless of the religion. For the most part, I think that most religions have a lot of the same basic, you know, morality, and uh, but at the same time. It's so easy to, uh, you know, take religious belief and, you know, uh, subvert and pervert that. And it that and it, that's done over and over again. That's I, I you know, uh, I, I was raised in uh, around organized religion, but now I'm not so much uh, a fan, um, you know, or e even right down to the, the Council of Nicaea. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know that if. If 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 everything that's in the Council of Nicaea, you know, the, the great con of 300 A.D. or 130 A.D. or whenever it was, I, I don't know if that's absolutely vital. I think, honestly, when it comes to like Christianity, per se, it's about the words in red, which is about, you know, forgiveness and love and a way to live your life, uh, you know, because, you know, everything that came before that, you know, and if and it's not, not just Christianity, you get just the same thing happens with Hinduism to Buddhism. And, you know, you can even have Judaism then branches into Christianity and then Islam as well. But like it's it's the same basic morality in the the 1.0 version is often a little harsher because it came about thousands of years earlier when you had to beat somebody over the head with a club to get them to understand, no, we don't kill people. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to club this into your head. You don't kill people. You don't steal. Don't take your neighbor's wife. You know, just this basic morality stuff that most everybody agrees on. Um, <clears throat> uh, but yeah, then, then when the second, the, the 2.0 versions come along, you know, you got Christianity, Islam, uh, Buddhism, I think I think there is uh, uh, there's something in all of them that kind of refines what came before, because what came before are really necessary, like foundational rules or whatever. And a lot of stuff that was probably, you know, a lot of the Leviticus stuff and a lot of the stuff that you find in like uh, Hinduism or whatever. I think a lot of that was situational stuff like, you know, it was a good idea at the time and place to do this. And then it just became written in stone, right? Uh, but it's the words in red, which is, you know, because that, that, the idea for me is that religion, the reason why it's so easy to subvert and pervert, you know, is because it, it's, it's so vital and it's, it's the battle between good and evil. So it's easy to get people wound up over that kind of thinking. And, you know, uh, politics, you know, I forgot who said it, but, you know, about how politics and religion kind of like Christianity and rock music, you know, like uh, th they should pretty much stick to their own sphere because whenever they try to mix, uh, they ruin each other. So, yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the the basic essence of Christianity is what's important. Uh, and but unfortunately, yeah, like yeah, absolutely. I've seen, you know, uh, Christianity, especially in the last in the last 2000 years, it's it's it, for, for most of the last 2000 years, it's been one of the most important factors guiding Western culture and civilization, like just in the last couple thousand years. And it's on the wane, I'd say, like, absolutely. It, you know, like I said, it really does. It comes down to the words in red. That's the important stuff. The rest of it, it's, it, you know, uh, 
like there's a hundred thousand rules in every religion. But I think, you know, if if you lose the message, that's to me like, you know, what makes uh, Jesus so important is like he came he, he came along basically pointing out like, no, you can follow all the rules, but the rules are just pointing towards kind of like the, the Bruce Lee quote about the finger in the moon, you know. Uh, uh, don't look at the finger or you miss all the uh, heavenly glory. The, the rules are the finger pointing towards goodness and uh, righteousness, whatever you want to call it, spirituality, whatever, uh, however you would put that. But here's the thing. I, I think we're going to return to that topic again and again, because I think it relates back to this story that you wrote, which is excellent back about your past and about exorcism and about what that means, but I think it also relates in some important ways to your work, the book that you're probably best known for, Pedagate mm -hmm. Primer, The Politics of Pedophilia. You've done some excellent interviews on this. And th the reason I went in that long, what sounds like a tangent is what we're trying to understand here is something beyond the politics of pedophilia. So I commend you for even taking it there because, you know, if we look at it from a psychology standpoint where they've tried to take this with the false memory syndrome, and, and it's not just that weird organization, that very, very dark organization that you've yeah. uncovered, but it's academia and modern psychology oh, yeah. and psychiatry, which is behind that whole thing, which would say, don't don't push these people. You gave me a new term the other day, minor attracted persons. They're yeah. NAP. Yeah. They're not criminals who are committing sex crimes against children, raping children. No, no, no. They're minor attracted people. We're going to put them yeah. in as, as another letter in our alphabet soup here. <laughs> My point is, until we understand some of that spiritual stuff, until we're willing mm -hmm. to go there, because the first step we have to go is, okay, psychology is bullshit. It's been engineered to promote a certain viewpoint. And then we look at the political, which is where you're willing to take us. Is this a brown stomach operation? Is it a human compromise operation? Yes, it is. But then the mm -hmm. third layer is, is it evil in some way that we don't normally talk about? So I'd laid a lot out there, but tell me what you think. I, I almost hint to that in, I guess, in the first chapter where I talk about like the Cleveland Street scandal. And I talk a little bit about, you know, Lewis Carroll, Charles Ludwig Dodson, better known as Lewis Carroll, the author of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And uh, talk about J.M. Barry, the author of Peter Pan, uh, which sadly, you know, for anybody who wasn't aware, Sadly, they are both most likely pedophiles. That really sucks, you know? Like, literally, one of my favorite children's authors is Lewis Carroll. And, you know, uh, yeah, uh, there's no evidence that they physically, uh, you know, sexually abused any children ever, though they did, you know, uh, it, it wasn't even an, an odd thing at the time. And, in, in, you know, the weird repressed Victorian era, uh, for whatever reason, you, you know, you couldn't show the legs on a chair, but having, you know, an 11 year old girl nude and taking pictures of her from every angle, that was okay for some reason. But yeah, I, I believe that this is something that goes back further than the Cleveland uh, street scandal. I do believe that, um, you know, uh, uh, I was talking to somebody who shared with me uh, the uh, Hunter S. Thompson, the, the opening to uh, his collection of essays, Hey Rube, where he's talking about how old uh, human sacrifice and child sacrifice is and how it's there's always been a lot of that that goes around in autumn and winter months, you know, and I think part of that probably goes back to the idea that especially in the, you know, the uh, the, the northern hemisphere and the western hemisphere, you know, uh, when all the trees died, <laughs> people, you know, ancient people freaked out and they were they were scared that if they didn't do certain things, um, you know, the, the lights would never come back on. The heat would never come back on. The trees wouldn't uh, bear fruit anymore. And, you know, uh, all over the world, all these different cultures uh, would sometimes do human sacrifice, sometimes child sacrifice. And a lot of this stuff was done in secret in these cult, you know, uh, mystery religions or cults. And a lot of uh, the, you know, modern secret societies 
you know, the, the, the whole of like, you know, 16th to 20th and 21st century secret societies is the story of a group saying, hey, you know, the original mystery school or secret religion, that was us too, you know, and whether they're actually connected, they always have like, you know, this, this long, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, it, history of, you know, their, their pedigree or whatever. Um, and, and yeah, whether or not they're, um, you know, just picking up elements. And, and I think that in a lot of cases, uh, like a lot of people who are members of the skull and bones or whatever, um, like, yeah, I believe that it's tied to a, you know, I guess a Luciferian philosophy, which, you know, it's the same kind of thing you get in some, some of the upper uh, degrees of Freemasonry. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I think that a lot of the people who are members of these secret societies aren't what you would call true believers. And that a lot of the true believers aren't members of X, Y, and Z secret society or cult. Uh, but yeah, I do believe that there's, you know, uh, some kind of, you know, d dark traditions that for whatever reasons, uh, you know, I, I like the fraternity hazing rituals, you know, that's that's a form of trauma based mind control, basically. I mean, that's literally what it is. Like, it's the same kind of thing that goes on in basic training. You know, you uh, you you, uh, ha, ha, you abuse and break down and rebuild and re-sculpt the psyche. That's the, the whole purpose of basic training and the third degree of Freemasonry and, you know, uh, the fraternity hazing. All, all of it is along the same lines. Uh, and And yeah, I do believe that some of that comes from like, uh, I guess you could call it kind of like an ancient technology right down to, you know, uh, and I also think that uh, art and literature and a lot of times even the genre, genre stuff, you know, like uh, uh, whether it's, you know, Kurt Vonnegut or Philip K. Dick or, uh, you know, Lovecraft. I, I think a lot of times these guys, Hoisman's, you know, I mentioned him in the book. Uh, I think a lot of times these guys did kind of encode some things into their fiction uh, because they couldn't speak plainly about it. Uh, and, you know, like Lovecraft is constantly talking about all these cults and things. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that when Lovecraft was briefly married to Sonya Green, she was part of the Crowley circle. She was an acolyte, you know? So when, when, when Lovecraft is talking about there's these crazy people and they want to bring monsters through a hole in the universe. Like that sounds crazy, but that's kind of what Crowley was doing when he was going to Giza in the middle of the night in Egypt. And like, which once again, uh, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that it's some of these old money families who were tied to some of these secret societies who funded SRI and their field trip to Giza. You know, when when they were doing the the remote viewing stuff, that they also you know uh, did you know did some kind of I I don't know I I don't think ritual is the type the uh, right type of word, even though. Like everything I've heard about like remote viewing and that's a subject I've been somewhat interested in for, you know, a couple of decades now, a little over a couple of decades now. Um, it's it's a protocol. But what's a protocol other than a ritual of sorts? You know, yeah, a ritual when people when you hear ritual, you think, you know, a cult ritual or a religious ritual. But no, I mean, like, you know, uh, I have a ritual of having a cup of coffee after I wake up in the morning. It's, it's something that I always do. It's something that gets me into a space of mind. It's something that, that if I don't do it, I'll feel off, you know? So yeah, I do believe that, you know, some of the, 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 the rites of Eleusis, for instance, the Dionysian rites, which are tied with the birth of, you know, uh, the, the, the birth of drama, the, you know, like talk about psyops. The, the Greek festivals of, of Dionysus and Eleusis were, were grand uh, public spectacles and in essence, uh, a form of psyop. I don't know, I don't know if psyop's the right word for it because like, I think 
you know, uh, what, whether that was what always occurred or not. I think that it was meant as a kind of a, a positive thing uh, and for social cohesion and all this kind of thing. But at the same time, like that's that's what they're doing at Bohemian Grove, too. That's what they tell themselves to sleep at night, too. So, you know, I don't know. But, yeah, I definitely believe that, uh, like you said, there's there's definitely a, a layer beyond, beyond politics. And when you mentioned psychology, you know, uh, you, you and Cameron, for instance, you know, uh, I mentioned him in the uh, MK Ultra chapter, the guy that did the psychic driving experiments and, you know, the the the. As, as recently as a couple of years ago, there are still, you know, they're having to sue the institutions now, you know, the, uh, the, the hospitals and the, uh, and, and the universities, uh, but there are still class action lawsuits going on uh, based on the, the victims of Ewan Cameron, who went on to become the head of the World Psychiatric Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the Canadian Psychiatric Association. You know, you mentioned the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Elizabeth Loftus's name comes up in the Hoffman Report, which is related to the role that, you know, some psychologists played and potential ethical violations in Guantanamo Bay. Um, so, you know, it, 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 and, and I do believe that on some level, uh, a lot of this stuff, it really is, you know, it's like a web. It is kind of all connected. you got to be careful when you connect the dots, though, because I think that a lot, um, you know, this is something we were talking about, too, uh, in correspondence. I think I think there's sometimes, uh, you know, I think that there's bad info put out there by certain actors uh, you know, whether they're witting or unwitting, you know, useful idi idiots or paid disinfo agents or whatever. Um, you know, I think you got to be really careful um, what you what you spread, you know, and like as for me, I'm a bottom feeder, like start with with the most far out conspiracy stuff, because that's where I'll find something new. Keep checking it, check it, check it against other sources, see what kind of corroboration you can get. But for me, yeah, I try and be like uh, really careful because, you know, uh, like especially when it comes to stuff like institutional child abuse, organized child abuse, uh, and these rings like with the whether it's the Cleveland Street or F Franklin Credit Union and, and Boys Town in Omaha or Epstein, you know, it's the same. It's the same rubric over and over and over again. Yeah, there's like a million points to jump off on their MK Ultra, And for people who don't know, you're just going to have to jump in there. Cameron, interesting in all the ways that you said, you know, Canadian Canada's Mengele, you know, is what they say. Yeah, it, it just like yeah. Gottlieb is Gottlieb is our Mengele. But yep, as you've documented that, you know, the kinds of experiments that they were doing on people are more than just the what's become the kind of cartoon trope oh they gave them lsd at a party yeah. when they didn't know about it oh right. they were yeah. so bad no man they were chaining kids down in beds and not letting them move and, and, and sensory deprivation stuff and you know you're not allowed to admit. yeah exactly yeah um, and breaking and, people and breaking people and intentionally and, and the, breaking the enormous people. amount of people who would become famous later and whether it's guys like Ken Kesey and Leonard Cohen or whether it's guys like Charles Manson and Ted Kaczynski, because all of them famously had close ties with at least, you know, some element of MK. In in the case of Charles Manson, we can't directly tie him. But I do believe like we know that he and the family uh, hung out in Haight-Ashbury. We know that Dr. Morris Jolly and West also had the, the free clinic at Haight-Ashbury. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I recently got some uh, papers released from the, the library special collections at UCLA on Dr. Jolly, by the way. Uh, in one of them, it's the, the Cult Awareness Network um, folder, one of the Cult Awareness Network folders that I got. 
And uh, you know, it's a fundraising letter. And Dr. Jolly says something along the lines of, oh, I've worked for years with the counterculture and civil rights movement. Oh, really, Dr. Jolly? Let's hear about your work with the counterculture and civil rights. I would love to hear your work with the counterculture and the civil rights movement. <laughs> So I don't think we can leave that without you telling a little bit of the story behind Dr. Jolly, because it's just critical information if people don't oh, know yeah, it. Absolutely. But let's keep it short, because I also, oh, yeah, want yeah. You to, I also want you to tell the story, if people don't know it, about the Cult Awareness Network. Oh, right. That's, that's such, that well, was what that was one of the coolest things about this folder. But yeah, so Dr. Jolly, uh, you know, brief thumbnail sketch. Um, this is a guy that always shows up, you know, whether uh, Jack Ruby uh, is is like before he dies of cancer, he starts talking about how people are giving him strange injections and he thinks they're trying to kill him. And then he talks to Dr. Jolly and he's cured of those delusions. Just like a psychiatrist, right? Uh, yeah. uh, trained, trained psychiatrist. A UCLA so. neuropsychiatrist, UCLA, like once again, you know, he's he's got the credentials just like Dr. Cameron. And, and I think in a lot of these cases, they're propped up by the CIA and, and these families that the CIA does, does a lot of the bidding of, you know, whether it's the, uh, you know, the Macy's and the Mellons and the Rockefellers, and it's all these families and these foundations over and over and over again. But yeah, Dr. Jolly shows up uh, with Jack Ruby and McVeigh and uh, Charles Manson just over and over and over again. Uh, uh, also, in multiple cases uh, during the satanic panic of, uh, you know, of child abuse daycare scandals that were, uh, you know, the, the media then started calling all that stuff, you know, a moral panic and that it was all just. So they're going to have to go off and read the rest of your stuff and listen to your stuff to find out more about Jolly. But yeah, like yeah. if you can't if you can't pick up the trail now, if you're like, no, give me more. Forget it. You're lost. You'll never get through <laughs> this stuff for real. <laughs> That is yeah. a huge thing. We're going to talk about it. But I think yeah. what I just said fits into the Cult Awareness Network. What's the Cult Awareness yeah, Network? Yeah, yeah. The, the Cult Awareness <clears throat> Network started out, it was uh, basically sort of a, you know, I don't know, uh, a cross between like a think tank and a lobbyist group and also an activist group uh, and a nonprofit charity, right? Uh but it also had as member uh, Dr. Morris Jolly and West, who also Jonesboro, you know, like when Jonesboro happened, he was called up there like, you know, he'd he'd been called in uh, on multiple cases regarding cults. That was one of his specialties, apparently. Um, and, you know, uh, the Cult Awareness Network. But who, who uh, comes you know, to who comes to own the Cult yeah, Awareness yeah, Network? The, 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 the folder I've got, it like starts around 1992. So it's like right around the takeover. The Scientologists, Scientologists, they had all these like, you know, multiple lawsuits. You know, uh, it's the same kind of thing that they did to the IRS, uh, where they literally had people infiltrating their offices and stealing things and, you know, pretending to be a member of the group and then saying things to make them look bad and like, but by the way, it, that's classic CIA tactics, you know, like classic CIA. Just to make sure we don't bury the lead here, Phil, the Cult Awareness Network is somewhat of an organic, genuine organization that is a, a call center, if you will. People are calling in and saying, yeah. oh, my gosh, I think I'm in a cult. What should I do? And they're giving good information out. And then all of a sudden they and start it turns. Getting Right. It turns yeah. out a lot of people who are calling in are saying, hey, the cult that I'm involved with are these Scientologists. So mm -hmm. what happens is the Scientologists buy the Cult Awareness Network. Yeah. So they yeah. buy the phone yeah. numbers. They buy the phone bank. And now the calls come in and they're answering them. They go, uh-huh, uh, tell me about your problem. And then it's yeah. like, a, yeah. a, it, you know, it's uh -huh. like a Simpsons episode. Now they're routed back yeah. into the, you know, the, the machine of uh, the thing. So, mm -hmm. it, and, and as you said, this infiltrate co-op is like, playbook, you know, blocking and tackling for the CIA. Yep. I didn't know that then Jolly was one of, he was probably then one of the earliest infiltrators, huh? Uh, that was kind of sent in. I think so, maybe, yeah. And and I don't know if Scientology, uh, you know, I, I, 
one of the few things that I agree with Scientology uh, about L. Ron Hubbard's history, I do believe that he probably worked with Intel a bit. I, I believe that he had some involvement with Intel because there are too many, like, like I said, this, this is OSS and early CIA 50s and 60s uh, Cold War shenanigans style uh, shakedown. Like just every every bit of it is it it sounds like and a lot of that stuff wasn't like I you know I know because I read these declassified documents they weren't declassified in 1952 to 56 when Scientology and Dianetics are being formed and founded you know like they're, they're they just the uh, I don't know if it's parallel construction or what. But yeah, I do believe that Scientology may have started out as, uh, uh, and you know, not just Scientology, but uh, it, Dr. Ruth Wangerin uh, uh, also thinks the Children of God might be uh, CIA. The Baha'i, uh, you know, the Iranians think that the Baha'i are infiltrated with uh, with CIA. Uh, you know, and the the thing about religion, you know, and religious freedom uh, is it's kind of a double edged sword there. That, you know, as soon as you, you know, uh, have this agreement to, well, yeah, yeah, we should allow people their religious freedom and expression. Uh, and then Scientology comes along and it's like, well, I'm not a religion, but I'm going to say that I am so that I get all the benefits of religion, which include, you know, stuff like secrecy and different levels and hierarchy and not questioning the people at the top of the pyramid and all this kind of uh, stuff that is very, you know, kind of cultic we have all these different levels that are like bracketed realities and we have to kind of jump between one and the next in my opinion but take mm -hmm. l ron hubbard the only way to l to understand l ron hubbard in my opinion and first and foremost is a kind of grifter kind of guy i mean he's Absolutely. a he's yeah. a scammer and he's very good at it and he's good at scamming people's money and he mm -hmm. moves in with jack parsons and the next thing you know he's fucking jack parsons girlfriend his girl and, yeah and at the same and then, time and he puts his him to <clears throat> give him his money and hey would you also now that i've got your girl would you also give me your money invest in a business give me some boats and stuff you know that's and a he's great like, story sure ron sure that's a whatever great... you say ron yeah and, and and you know so anyone who wants to reflect on that can say i know people like that i know people and both sense if whether you're the one being victimized or whether Unfortunately, you're the one who victimizes other people. You know people who can con people and the con doesn't stop. Like you're saying with, with Elrond, you know, he not only gets the girl, then he says, yeah, you know, this strange boat deal. Like oh, we're gonna go to Miami and buy a boat and then sail it back here to California and we'll make a lot of money and we'll split it. All we need you to do is- Put up all the money and give us a free boat to get the other boat with. Like what? So that's- And that's literally after, but this is with Marjorie, Marjorie Cameron, the his ex. Like he's already like uh exactly. and also the bit straight out of the like Tom Sawyer. Like I almost have to respect Elron occasionally <laughs> because he comes from that like larger than life PT Barnum uh huckster tradition that's so quintessentially American. You know, what's more American than PT Barnum? Like, you know what? I'm going to take a bunch of rubes for their money. Uh, you know, sadly, uh, you know, it, 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 it is, it was and is an awful course of cult. But at the same time, I can't help but like some of these stories, it's just so, it's so insane that like, you know, uh, they were going to do a sex ritual out in the desert. And they did. I think this is how he stole his girlfriend, I think, because like initially Jack Parsons was going to have sex with his girlfriend. He's like, wait, Jack. <laughs> maybe maybe Idea. i could have sex with your girlfriend and you could be the one who's like watching us and saying the stuff you could be reciting stuff <laughs> while i'm having sex with your girlfriend who we will later embezzle from you and have you start a business so that we can steal you like it's crazy yeah like it, uh it's i mean you know i i don't know it's it's just it's mind blowing levels of, uh, you know, it, 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 that's mind control, by the way, you know? People well, like, well, they, it, they, it, they it is. Mind control is like creating a perfect zombie or something like that. There's like you said, with different levels, there's so many different, you know, 
advertising and PR are methods of mind control for that matter. Yeah, well, all, all communication is, you know, methods mm -hmm. of mind control. All hypno We're all being hypnotized by ourselves, but right. we're being hypnotized and influenced by other people. But I don't want to go down that track, uh, that hole too far because you, you kind of threw some other stuff on the table. You actually jumped to the next bracketed reality beyond that, which is the spiritual. So when he does go out and perform these rites and rituals under the direction of Crowley, right? Because Crowley is in mm -hmm. communication with Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons, Parsons reaches out yeah. to Crowley and says, I'm your number one guy. I want to be your number one agent yeah. in, and uh, you know, uh, Crowley from all accounts has a little bit of that huckster in him too. Oh, absolutely. You know? Yeah. And, and and he loved Jack, apparently. I think that the that relationship ruined it uh, because when he saw he's like, no, 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 that's what you do to the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't you don't believe in that stuff. You get the other guy to believe and you take his girlfriend and his money and his boat. And that's woo -doo -doo -doo. that's the <laughs> trick. Like and then you say abracadabra. And, you know, or Ararita or whatever, uh, and, and call it a day. Uh, I really do believe that, like, because, you know, uh, the, the, the Feral House is a book, Sex and Rockets, you know, and it's it got some of the some of the letters back and forth. And it's really kind of sad. It's really kind of sad and pathetic, honestly, because you can see, like, Crowley gets more and more upset. And he's like, this guy is a con artist and he's conning you. You know, and this is somebody who, yeah, may have been the head of the Astromagir uh, Argentum or Ordo Templi Orientis if he had not embarrassed himself in front of his guru. You know, like that that ruined it that 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 I think that like really drove a wedge between the Crowley and Parsons relationship, honestly, because it you know, it, it's got to be kind of like disheartening to see like, you know, like your number one pupil and then it's like oh no he's got no common sense though he's gotten <laughs> zero common sense yeah well, so but we're, we're kind of dancing around this other aspect to it well there's two other aspects to it one uh, is the cia kind of big game stuff somebody's got to run the rule world and it ought to be us and his connections l ron hubbard's connections there are undeniable as you said mm -hmm. and he kind of wraps himself in this kind of quasi military uh, navy yeah, kind yeah, of stuff yeah. and we can get into all that but then the other part that i keep kind of dancing around i can't pin down is I, and you're not saying this but i think it's a misstep that a lot of people take to say oh okay then it's all fake no that doesn't mean that it's right. fake it doesn't mean that they were not attempting to or successfully connecting with spirits for lack of a better term in this extended realm that are becoming their partners in engaging in this and have some ability to influence world events and things down well, here you, or you definitely to influence calling, people they're calling the star child or moon child or whatever out in the desert and this is the same desert right around where they're testing the the atomic bomb you know uh, and it's also the same little spot of land where over the next like five years, the majority of the, uh, you know, UFO sightings would be right in this same. No, let's not go there because I, I, I don't think you got the UFO thing right. I don't think you've, you've put all the, the pieces on the, on the table. I mean, if we want to jump there now, we can. But I kind of think we got to finish the uh, Stargate thing because. Oh, what, yeah, what, yeah. What happens here is super interesting and, uh, gosh, like the reason I bring up immediately Stargate, just so people understand this, you know all this stuff backwards and forwards, so I'm not telling you, but L. Ron Hubbard has, starts Scientology, so he, whatever blend it is of this kind of satanic, spiritual, occulted, real connection with these extended realms, and also his kind of pragmatic hucksterism, good old American hucksterism. How can I rip everyone off? He starts Scientology and lo and behold, because there is this military connection, as you described, military intelligence is, hey, whatever works. You know what I mean? You want to yeah. call it Satan. You yeah. want to go, we don't care. We just want to conquer yeah. that hill. And to a certain extent, that has to always be the job of the military and in a way that we don't understand because you're not inside that culture but what they'll tell you is hey we've been through this for thousands of years and i'll tell you at the end of the day phil 
when it's me defending you, you don't give a fuck whether I think I, whether I have Satan tattooed on my back or not. You just want me to keep those motherfuckers from coming through your front door. And I know that, and I've lived that over and over again. So don't tell me how all moralistic and Christian you are, because I know at the end of the day, it's about protection and it's about keeping the bad guys from coming over that hill. Military has that ingrained in them at a kind of core level that we don't get because we haven't been in the military. But military intelligence then takes that and extends that and says, oh, okay, that means I can do whatever I want because at the end of the day, I have the ultimate trump card. So L. Ron Hubbard is connected with that. And that L. Ron Hubbard gets connected with this SRI remote viewing project in in uh, at Stanford, Stanford, you know, great university, and these two laser physicists, who the laser part of it is kind of interesting, probably has an ET connection there, but they st all these guys, not all of them, but a lot of these guys that are doing SRI are in Scientology. The, the top three guys, yeah, uh, you know, Pat Price, Ingo Swan. Uh, oh, I'm blanking on the third name, but like the top three guy, the top three guys and in fact uh after pat died i guess i believe it was just like it, the the two guys were the core of like they were they were running the lab at sri the crazy thing about well that, well hell put off hell put off is uh you yeah, know, has put the, off right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. uh the crazy part about this, this is around like okay 1978 the fort meade maryland and the defense uh, intelligence agency picks up Stargate as like a military project. And this is around the same time that Operation Snow White is going on, where Scientologists have infiltrated uh, the IRS and law firms and like all these various, you know, levels of government. And they're leaking documents, you know, apparently, I think it was John Attack who wrote that, uh, the, the reason why they were leaking the documents was in mainly just to cover their tracks, because if they just stole Scientology documents, then it would be easy to figure out who stole, who's stealing the IRS documents about Scientology's tax debt, you know, the Scientology is. No, but if you steal like, you know, all this interesting stuff and leak some of it to the press and, you know, meanwhile, you're also like in in the senator's office or you're a janitor cleaning up uh, at the IRS at and like literally there were it was the largest domestic spying operation in the United States that we know of and around the same time as that's going on Scientologists are running the CIA CIA lab at SRI I don't think that's like like you said and, and this is like a whole point we could get off on and about being careful about connecting the dots mm -hmm. because there's a lot of different ways to connect the dots and sometimes they come up with different images once you connect them and mm -hmm. moreover the, the connecting the dots involves people and people are complicated so here's a guy I recently interviewed right. and I really enjoyed uh talking with him Nick Cook so Nick Cook just wrote a biography about Ingo Swan and he met Ingo Swan on several occasions and he also has close connection with the family well if you look at Ingo Swan and who he is it, it puts a different spin on this whole story Ingo Swan is psychic he's psychic as hell he's like one of the greatest psychics in the United States. And he's going on TV on like the old TV uh, reality shows, game shows, like what's my line? And he can read people's mind. And this is who he is and who he does. And, and he's also an artist. He's an incredible artist and he lives yeah. in New York City. He is recruited by SRI because of his psychic abilities. And sometimes people get this wrong and they think, well, what is remote viewing? And they're using Ouija boards. And I heard you on Opperman. I love Ed Opperman, but he's a, you know, tent revival Christian kind of, that's his, his, his locked into that worldview and it, Ouija boards and Ouija boards. Like, what about Ouija board? Ouija board suggests that there's some ability to connect with this extended realm in some way. Well, start nailing down what that means, what that extended realm is, who is in that extended realm? How are they interacting? Just don't paint it with this Sunday school Christianity. Oh, there's Satan and there's Jesus and Jesus loves me. All 
you just got to start with terraforma. You got to go all the way down and get to the ground. And we don't know what that is. Back to Ingo Swan. Ingo Swan is psychic. I don't know why some people are psychic, but some people are just gifted in that way. They can read minds. They can remote view things. They don't call it remote viewing, but they can see things that aren't in their immediate view. The CIA, back to what we're saying, be the, being the CIA says, need to talk to that guy. So they bring Ingo Swan out and they say, here's what we want to do. The Russians got this submarine base over there. Do you think you could like see that submarine base from here in Palo Alto? Ingo says, well, let me give it a try. And they go, well, wait, 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 wait. Okay, you think you might be able to do it. I'll tell you what, before you give it a try, right down the road here, we got this super secret Livermore Labs, this super secret thing buried. We're not even gonna tell you what it is, but it's buried in six feet of cement. And inside that six feet of cement is a Faraday cage. And inside that Faraday cage is something else. And no one can do it. And can you get in there? Can you see it? Can you? And Ingo Swan says, yeah, I can see it. As a matter of fact, I, I, I can see it and I can stop it. I can stop your little clock in there. <laughs> and he does it. And they're super excited, but they're fucking freaked out as well. Because now we're talking about this extended realm, and this extended realm is outside of our space and time, and it kind of blows the water out of all the crap that we do about building all that stuff. So that's who Ingo Swan is. And now they say, oh, okay. Now back to that Russian submarine thing. I tell you what, do you think you could train other people to do what you do? And he says, yeah, I could. I mean, everybody has a little bit of this gift and here's how to do it. And he develops a training class, a protocol. And that's what becomes remote viewing. So to read that story differently, I mean, I'm open to, that's my interpretation of the story, of course. But if you're going to change that story, tell me the, the, the factual pieces that change that story. That's what I love about your work. I mean, you have the factual pieces there and you're laying down the story. And I'm going to add one other part to that in, in this kind of sharing that we're doing here. The other super interesting guy in that to me is, and I, I've told this story before on the show, so it might get boring to some people, but is uh, Joe McMonagle. And, and you've heard mm -hmm. of Joe McMonagle. Oh, yeah. Psychic yeah. spy number 001. But what a lot of people don't know about Joe McMonagle is... The reason he comes to SRI is because he has a near-death experience. And the reason he has a near-death experience is because he's a fucking spy. <laughs> he's on our side. He's a, working on the border of East Germany and West Germany. And as he tells a story on my show, I interviewed him, he's in a restaurant that is kind of a known hangout for spies. This is like right out of a movie or something. <laughs> but it, this is how he tells it. He's having lunch, dinner, whatever, and he starts grabbing his throat, uh, just like in a movie. He's being poisoned. He immediately tries to leave, out, leave the restaurant. He staggers and falls. A couple of his intelligence buddies come and grab him, and they put him in a Jeep. At this point, McMonagle dies. If you don't know about near-death experience science, you might go, well, he didn't die because he came back. No, he died. That's what we call it. That's what medicine calls it after your heart stops beating for a couple minutes and there's no blood to your brain we call that death and we might hypothesize about how that's not really death but then that raises a bunch of questions about what is this extended realm in our realm that is death that's what we've always called it to be death joe now though back to our story is outside of his body looking down at the jeep as it drives frantically through the East German, West German border, trying to find a hospital. And they call ahead and they get an ambulance and they transfer him to an ambulance and he gets in the hospital and they're able to save him. Joe McMonagle wakes from his, and he has, I should say, not only this ability to see outside of his body, but he has a near-death experience. He goes and he encounters the divine. He encounters the greater consciousness that doesn't care about this game and all this nonsense. He's relieved from 
all that and isn't in the infinite love realm that so many near-death experiencers talk about. He meets God, for lack of a better term. But when he awakens back in this realm, the first thing he sees are two military intelligence officers that say, hey, buddy, what the hell happened? What's going on? Did it? Right in his face, they want to, quote unquote, debrief him on what happened, both his poisoning and you know everything else. And he tells them. He tells them about being outside of his body, and he tells them all the rest of that stuff. And then he goes on with his military career until he shows up at SRI because he's ordered to go and check these guys out. And lo and behold, I don't know if it's Russell Targ or Hal Putoff, but they unseal his secret sealed military file and they pull out a book. And the book is Raymond Moody's book, A Near-Death Experience. And the important thing to me there, and this is like classic Phil Fairbanks putting together the pieces, they knew that there was something about near-death experience about mm. being in that extended realm that also connected with the <clears throat> crazy stuff they were doing with remote viewing and Ingo Swan and outside of space time and how do we see Russian subs from Palo Alto. They didn't know exactly how it all worked, but they did know at some and some level that this extended consciousness realm of near-death experience was somehow related to that so long story but that is my terra firma on uh, stargate and remote viewing it is all the other things that you say like you are I, I don't think you are incorrect at all and like these guys say here's another interesting tie back to your work and again folks when we're talking to phil fairbanks we're talking to a guy who wrote the story was in paranoia magazine yeah yeah, MK Ultra on, on MK Ultra in like 2003 or 2004 ish. Yeah, 2003. <laughs> Think about that. That's almost 20 years ago. He's scooping the, the muck yeah. and laying out the dirt <laughs> on MK Ultra. Unbelievable. I mean, that is a, a foundational kind of investigative research that you know he's never going to get any credit for it because that's not oh, he'll get he'll get a little, yeah, get a nobody little wants to nobody wants to know yeah <clears throat> uh you know you know th there's a lot of ties between the stargate and mk ultra as well not least of which being purich but also frank sydney Olson. sydney you know, gottlieb sydney Olson. gottlieb exactly frank olson purich uh, uh gottlieb all like right here in the venn diagram the 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 events that led to frank olson who once again, you know, they dose him with acid and then they push him out of a 13th uh, story window after knocking him on the back of the head because it wasn't until like, you know, his body's exhumed and they finally do a real autopsy where it's discovered that no, he, he was dead before he hit the ground. He, you know, he got bashed on the back of the head, was thrown out of a window because when you fall out of a window and you committed suicide, then they're not going to check to make sure. Now, is the reason why his head is shattered that he jumped out a window or was he bashed on the back of the head first? Uh, but yeah, there's a, like a lot of ties between the, the SRI and MK Ultra and Puharich and Gottlieb and Olsen and all this kind of stuff. Like a lot of this stuff, it ties back and forth. And, and I think part of that, you know, I, I, I keep going back to... You know, it's it's these foundations uh, run by old money families who, you know, uh, I, I like to point out that like the CIA, uh, the CIA is is, you know, grew out of the OSS, which was basically a bunch of skull and bones men who once again, old money types, Prescott Bush, for instance, and uh, uh, Billy Russell and a lot of these folks. Um, they were already rich and then they doubled their wealth in the opium wars you know so this this is this is like these these old money families who uh were involved in the opium wars and then were selling heroin through the emerald triangle uh in indochina and vietnam and then afghanistan and you know 
so that's like that 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 that's another part of the story that I think uh, you know eventually eventually like I said uh, uh, the 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 foundations and uh, uh, I guess you could call them oligarch families or whatever. I, I hear you. And sometimes I think that's true, but sometimes I read those biographies and it sounds just like when we broke down L. Ron Hubbard and you go, no, I know that guy. He's just a, he's just a huckster. And when you read right. about uh, Bush, old man Bush, I understand Prescott Bush. He is not an insider. He is not an elite. He doesn't have the money. What he sees is a way to get in with, this, with these guys who do have the money. And maybe that'll get me the money. And maybe I can make my kids rich, which he does, and all the rest <laughs> it, of that it, stuff. It worked, but yeah. I, yeah, I look at Prescott Bush, and I understand Prescott Bush. He's just trying to—he's trying to make it, like you said. He's old-fashioned American, uh, even though uh, he has other. And then mm -hmm. the, the other thing I always do in, in these discussions that uh, kind of shift things a little bit, just like that last one did, is. You got to look at the reincarnation research, science, you know, and again, I got a University of Virginia and, you know, you look at what those guys did and all the research they compiled and are still compiling and Jim Tucker is still compiling it and there's new stuff that they're discovering all the time. It totally throws this for a loop. The bottom line for me is that people who are messing with the spiritual realm, for the most part, don't know what the fuck they're doing. You know, not that anyone can, because the spirits like to fuck right. with people. Exactly. That's the only thing we can. That's the only thing we can surmise from all this is the spirits like to fuck with people. And when you get God is different. Like the near death experience accounts, there's there's no go go read them. You can read thousands of them. You can search through the near death near death uh, research foundation Jeff Long's website where he has thousands of them chronicled. New York Times best selling author and uh, a doctor physician. All these carefully compiled surveys. There's no Moloch. There's no uh, satanic. None of that. When these people encounter God, encounter the light, walk into that. There's none of that nonsense. It's like if you want to create that game down here, well, there's apparently on some lower spiritual level, there's these entities that'll kind of jump right in there and create that game with you. But on some other level, it's not real in some sense. And again, I'm not saying I have any of that figured out to any extent, but I, I, I kind of can call bullshit on some of this stuff. And the one thing I'd call bullshit on is this bloodline thing. You can think your bloodlines are super important and uh, reincarnation research will tell you they don't mean shit. You don't know where you're going to come back and who you're going to be. And somebody can groom you like your parents can groom you into believing that all this stuff is true, but that don't make it true. So I, I, I guess I, I kind of got off on a bit of a tangent there, but that's my read of these, uh, these families and oligarchs and that's ah, all bullshit. Regardless of whether, you know, like, you know, they say you can't take it with you. If, if that goes for your consciousness and uh, your lineage or whatever, then so be it. But I still, I don't know, for whatever reason, even even if it's not so much, uh, even if it's more about, you know, perpetuating uh, the uh, their thing, you know, that thing that they're a part of, uh, which, which, you know, for, for whatever reason, you know, it, it makes no sense to me why, like royalty, you know, like literally it's, uh, when, when you think about it, like, you know, it's, it's like, you know, okay, let's, let's find the most inbred people in Europe and we'll just put them in charge of everything. Cause like, honestly, like it's royalty. The reason why the Royals tend to have hemophilia and polydactyly, why is that? It's because they only marry their cousins, you know, I, that, I, I don't know. It makes no sense to me at all. Uh, but I well, believe we're, we're that not. there's some reason for it. Uh, you know, like, well, the reason for it is that they believe it to be true, you know, so and, and this was why I kind of <clears throat> hammered so hard on the Christian thing It's like there's millions of people, hundreds and hundreds of generations who have found inspiration from the, the life of Jesus. Well, does it matter that that life isn't historically accurate? In some respects, it does. And in some other respects, it doesn't because our connection to 
this spiritual realm is misunderstood by us because it has to be. We are not yeah. in a position. Yeah. We are the dog, you know, like you, I got a dog who's at the window. She wants to go for her walk. She she is incredibly empathetic on a number of levels, and it probably can process information, and, you know, can smell things and all this. But on another mm -hmm. cognitive level, she just cannot process things the same way that I can. Yeah, yeah. This is what people tell us about being in the extended realm all the time. They say, I knew the answers to everything. And then when I came back here, I didn't have them anymore. So does it surprise me that people can follow some really being influenced into following some really sick, stupid thing of there's this bloodline and we all have to have this family and stuff like that. Because genealogically, right, sometimes we have these royals in this bloodline and then you find out there's a little thing going on in the back and that guy, that kid wasn't exactly, you know, this and that. Right. Well, hey, he was up until a minute ago. He was a part of the bloodline and the whole thing. <laughs> it, it's it to me, it fits much more into that kind of scenario of a human created, a human idea than it does this the, uh, the deep reality of royals or bloodlines or any of the rest right. of it. it's human invention i think oh yeah yeah uh it, you know I, I i would agree with you there uh but but at the same time i think that there's some part of humanity that apparently kind of craves it because otherwise why would you know it's it's one of those things um you know, like uh, the transpersonal, it's a transpersonal experiences, I guess, uh, Charles Tart would put it, because it's like the idea of there's, uh, you know, there's certain things that show up in, in every culture. And like, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the, these basic archetypes that, you know, they're going to be shaded and colored a little bit differently based on the individual and the society and the culture that, uh, that the individual is brought up in. But apart from that, there are certain things and apparently having, you know, one family that keeps ruling everything. That's, that's something that shows up like, you know, just going back thousands of years ago when the people over here and people over there never could have, you know, never could have met. They weren't able to compare notes, but this kind of tribalism and fiefdoms and and kingships and uh, by the way i'm not saying that that's as it should be or or that we shouldn't struggle against that i think that a lot of what maybe is inherent in human nature is not necessarily a good thing like if if all of human nature was inherently good then we wouldn't have the world that we live in you know with with uh like extreme injustice and inequality and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but then on the other, uh, on the other hand, like, I think that there's like some part of it, like I, you know, uh, I think that there's, there's some kind of an explanation for it, but once again, I think it's, you know, probably archetypal and metaphorical for the most part. That's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, whether it's religion, mythology, folklore or whatever, you know, I think that there are some things that you can't speak plainly about. And that's where poetry and art and religion, you know, they sometimes fare better than a simple equation. Why do you keep throwing religion in there? Why isn't religion better understood as a mind control social engineering project? Same way that you said that the intelligence organizations, it doesn't take long to build the playbook. You start finding right. certain things that work. Trauma works, you know, group love, group community, our, our need to be a pack, you know, these things work. Well, mm -hmm. why, why doesn't that just explain religion in a way? Because I'm with you on poetry and art and transcendent experiences that we have that can do that. And I believe that you can attach a transcendent experience to religion. But to me, the idea that I'm going to put together a book and become your spiritual intermediary and tell you that you cannot understand your experiences unless you come through me, oh, that just sounds like good old fashioned you know, hokum to me, it, it, my, it, and beyond hokum, it sounds like 
in coercion and ability to control people in order to gain an advantage. I can see why you would think that. And I completely get why some people are turned off of uh, religion and especially uh, especially like, for instance, Christianity. And and I certainly wouldn't uh, try and pretend that a mass of evils hadn't been done in the name of Christianity. In fact, the majority maybe even of what's been done in the name of organized religion, most of it's not good stuff. Like I, I, I'll go ahead and concede that right there. But like, you know, it's uh, whether you want to call it religion or whatever, but when cavemen first like found some kind of mushroom and then all of a sudden felt like putting some berry juice on some walls and next thing you know, there's art there and Uh, I believe that art and communication and language, I believe that they are all kind of tied together. And like the the word religion itself, you know, re legare, to bind back together again. I think that's what religion should be. Um, Then again, like I said, as far as organized religion, yeah, in, in most cases, organized religion subverts that natural desire for, you know, like you said, transcendence and in connection with the divine or eternal or 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 s- some higher level, which, you know, it, even Kurt Gödel show, showed us that even math is incomplete, you know, even our number system, like there, there are some inconsistencies and then you have to go to a higher level and then that one's going to have inconsistencies and it's just, you know, infinite regression from there. I know I'm kind of hammering on the religion thing, but I can't I can't let go without this story. So I'm interviewing this guy, Jurgen Ziva. Unbelievably fantastic. I love this guy. One of the most gifted out of body experience travelers, if you will. He's written this book, Multidimensional Man. And he's just has this ability to leave his body and enter into these extended realms in a very, very amazing way that he can bring back this information. Anyways, he's telling me this story about his trip to Greece. And I don't know if you've ever seen this monastery in Greece that's built on this little island. And it's this tiny little island and they built this huge fortress because, you know, this carrying the light of God is not easy and there's people who are going to attack you. So you got to have a fortress than the monastery. And you walk up, if you ever see a picture of it, You have to walk up this trail of miles up and up and up and up the mountain. And he does that and he gets there and there's all these Greek Orthodox, which was, I was raised Greek Orthodox. Mm. And there's all these people there who are trying to have some kind of experience, some kind of connection, but they're not allowed in the monastery. You know, you can only go like to the, the gift shop kind of thing. Lo and behold, one of the priests leans over and sees Jürgen and says, come on in, come on in, come on in. Gives him this special kind of treatment. There's something going on here, right? So he brings him into this room and first they connect and they talk and they're just like, they like each other and they talk and they have this thing. And then he says, hey, I wanna show you something. And the priest brings him into the room and the room is black, dark, And suddenly he goes over and he hears a creaking metal thing and he's lowering this candle chandelier. And as the chandelier comes down, the candlelight reaches and it shows this icon of, I forget who it was, some saint, Virgin Mary, I don't know. Jürgen says it was an unbelievable ecstatic experience. Tears were dripping down my face. I felt in my heart uh, the love of God just burst through me. And I was like shaken to my knees. And the guy, crick, 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 pulls the chandelier up and it's dark again. And he goes, oh my God, that was such an incredible experience. You know, da, 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 da. So he comes back the next day, Jürgen does. He wants to see this guy. He wants to kind of rehab that experience and just kind of understand it at a deeper level. And he says, hey, you know, I want to go see Father Philip or whatever the guy's name is. And he goes, oh, what are you talking about? No, 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 you can't get in here. And then suddenly Father Philip comes in. He goes, oh, no, that's my buddy. And he lets him in. He goes, you know, I was thinking about that experience. I want to know. He goes, okay, I'll take you to another room. So he takes him to another room. Same thing, completely dark, lowers the candles. Again, 
He has this ecstatic experience, this connection with Christ consciousness, this connection with the love of God. It is complete. It is uh, all-consuming outside of space and time. But the question that I asked Jurgen is, so are you a Christian? And he kind of chuckles. He's Austrian, German. He goes, well, well, no, I'm not a Christian. And his answer is kind of like, I've had these experiences, you know, a good part of my life. And it's incredible that I had them from this icon and this icon was able to initiate that inside of me. But I don't understand that to mean that I should follow all the other stuff that they believe. There's a direct spirit out there that is God that I'm way, way paraphrasing for Jurgen, but you get the point. And yeah. that's, I guess, where I come down on religion. Religion is an unnecessary intermediary between you and your relationship with God. But to attach it to the icon is, it might be useful because the icon might help. You have that transpersonal experience. Right. Yeah, yeah, but absolutely. back to what you're saying about Buddha pointing to the moon, it's it's just a finger point. The Bible, right. the red, yeah, yeah, the red, yeah, yeah. If, the red if you words get too caught up on the on, well, even on the red the words aren't you trapped, yeah. And the red words aren't the red words. They're just your red words. They're just your interpretation of. It. They're not the red words. They're just red words in a book. Uh, as for me, I guess as for like the red words. No, I, I mean more so like, you know, just the, the pared down message, love, tolerance, forgiveness, you know, which once again, like I said, you know, the everything else, you know, distill it down to the essentials. I think that's, you know, that's like everybody, uh, everybody who's clamoring for a revolution. I, I hope they realize that until people have a revolution within themselves, then it's not going to change out here because the way the, the way the world is and the reason why it's the way it is is because of the way the people are because you know we've been you know creating culture for thousands of years and so now we're uh, born into this world with thousands of years of of cultures and culture clashes basically the idea though of of love and forgiveness and what you know I, I i definitely believe that's you know it's 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 key to just living a good life until until you you know change yourself from within and uh can be more loving and kind and you know uh then then all the other things all the other work it's not going to be as uh uh productive as it could be or should be maybe Okay, I'm going to pull you in a different direction. I know I'm raking you over the coals here, but <laughs> that's what we do on Skeptico. The ET thing. Why aren't you down with the ET thing? Let me play a little clip from, I think, a, a, a really great movie, not a perfect movie, but a great movie, The Phenomenon, and, and then we'll talk about it. Cases oh, yeah. that are not explainable in conventional terms. That have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. When we got right up to it, it lit up. Was this a warning? Was this an attempt to communicate? Felt scared. I was running and playing, and then I saw this maroon color in the sky. It was not anything from this earth. He was looking at all of us. Okay, I might stop there. Where My starting point I guess, especially lately for people who are not ET UFO friendly or not on board is the nukes, because the nukes kind of cut through all the bullshit, all the consciousness bullshit and get right down to nuts and bolts. So the UFOs fly over the nukes in Maelstrom Air Force Base and they, the guys report, hey, there's UFOs up here. What do we do? So this is in the record. Like this is the military has records of this and this has come out because these guys have disclosed it. 
And then they say, well, gosh, I don't know. And then the UFOs fly over each one of the silos. They shoot down a red beam and they disable the nukes one by one. And each one of these, by our best technology, our best computers of the 1960s, 70s, whatever they are, these things are completely independent. That's the idea. You wouldn't want one nuke going out and, oh, gosh, go plug it back in. They're all out. It's like, no, this is impossible to do. So there is an intelligence that flies around in these nuts and bolts crafts and shoots down this beam. And this intelligence has the ability to understand our most advanced technology and disable it. Now in Russia, in the Ukraine, after the wall falls and we goes in there and they go, oh, you know what? Same thing happened to us, but they turned them on. The nukes flew over our silos and one by one, they turned them on and we were panicking. We were like, these things are going to go off and the world is going to end because we're going to be destroyed. And then the UFOs shut them down one by one. So when people are not, like I say, UFO friendly and ET friendly, because some people, strangely enough, will acknowledge UFOs but will not acknowledge ET, uh, it, 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 I don't know. Here we have the intel. So we have the nuts and bolts here. We have intelligence. We have technology. And we have some kind of message, which gets us into the good ET, bad ET thing. So <laughs> what I, say you, know, you Phil? I, I'm, I'm not certain. I kind of like, once again, the, the idea that a lot of these things that we're hearing about all through history, you know, Ezekiel talks about flying saucers. You know, there's uh, there's whirling fires in the sky. And, you know, I think that since we're in a post-industrial society, that's why we're seeing them as aliens and in flying saucers. Hold on. Got to jump in there. It doesn't wash in the sense that if we are going to have this discussion, if we are in this consensus reality, speaking around the world, you're in the Philippines. I'm in Southern California. We're talking through Zoom where all this stuff works. If we're going to accept that that is the, the consensus reality, because there can be all sorts of different realities. As we're saying, there can be this extended consciousness reality. There can be this simulation that we're in. There can be all this other shit. But for right now, we're talking about the nuts and bolts reality of us communicating in Zoom. That is the same reality that they experienced at the nuclear Air Force Base and that they had these rockets that if they shoot them off, they do go and they do blow up shit and they would destroy incinerate millions of people and they turned them on and turned them off so uh, i think we just have to uh, put ezekiel to the side for a minute and say this is what happened here this is our nuts and bolts reality and then we have to try and make sense of that inside of this reality before we start jumping off into some other, uh, you know, kind of right. explanation. Well, what I'm saying though, what we're experienced as, you know, uh, there's the Duatha de Danan in, in the, the, the Celtic idea or the uh, Anunnaki for the Sumerians, but there's, you know, this idea that once again, it's, uh, it's people who never met each other had an idea of, you know, there were these, these, uh, uh, brilliantly talented uh, people or the idea of, uh, you know, the, the Nephil of those who came from above, you know, that the word Elohim is is plural, by the way, meaning they who come from above. I think that there's a possibility that there can be different ex different explanations for different uh, phenomenon and experiences. But uh, I think there's also a possibility that you know, whatever it was that the Egyptians saw uh, and, and, and the Mayans saw, you know, like there, there, you know, there are some, uh, you know, weird stories of, you know, uh, I guess you could call them uh, gods or, or demiurges or angels or demons, or you could call them, uh, you know, hyperdimensional beings or, or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I think that there's like, even if, and uh, here's where we might disagree again, even if reality is just what we believe, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, but even so, even if there are no angels and demons, there are because they exist in our dreams. They are because they exist like 
that's why they're in our mythology. I think it was Ernst Kasserer, uh, Kasserer, the dreams are private myths and mythology are public dreams. Like that's kind of the way I see it as far as like the consensus trance and consensual reality or whatever. Yeah, I think I think that, um, you know, there's a firm scientific basis for the idea that things are not as they appear. Just just that that alone. I think I think that can be taken to be, you know, uh, as a fundamental, things are not necessarily as they they appear. Uh, you know, for instance, j- just right down to the fact that, like, you know, the things that appear solid to me are actually vibrating on 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 some level. You know, everything's vibrating on some level, uh, regardless how it, it it appears on the level. You know, however, uh, I have to process it uh, in order to uh, you know. Uh, like, uh, what was it? The uh, I, I corresponded with uh, Dr. Charles Tart for a little while. I, I liked his description of ego as a reality coping mechanism. <laughs> the idea of I, for instance, that this is my reality coping mechanism, my personality, uh, uh, the, the, the ego, the, 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 this is just, this is just how I deal with the fact that, you know, uh, like I'm, I, I, I'm not the same body that I was ten years ago. I'm not the same mind that I was uh, five minutes ago. You know, it's you know. Uh, uh, so yeah, like I, I honestly don't, I, I don't know how important it is to know uh, whether whether uh, you know something is uh, just an archetypal metaphor, and that's why it's in everybody's uh, mythology and dreams. And, you know, uh, shows up in art and literature over and over again. Like, is there, you know, I, I, don't, I don't even know, you know, I mean, I, I, I see the value in if there, if there was a way to get a crowbar and pull them apart. But as it is, like, if, if you can't, like, I think maybe part of the mystery is part of the fun, you know, like, uh, it's kind of like the idea of, you know, of course, we can't understand, you know, the mind of God. Uh, the the you can't understand how could you fathom that of uh, whatever created you that's like the idea of uh you know i've heard it said that if uh you know our brains are far too you know complex for us to fully understand uh and if they were simple enough for us to figure out we would be too dumb <laughs> at that point you know so it's it's like that's that, that's how i see that whole you know, it's, it's kind of like a, like a riddle or a koan or whatever, but like, like for me, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's, uh, entirely important to know, you know, uh, uh, when it, when it comes to, uh, to some matters anyways, I, I can see where, uh, for other people, uh, it, it would be a, a, of a much greater value. And, and like I said, if there was an answer, there is, you know, uh, you know, a definitive answer, but that's the whole thing, you know, uh, sometimes uh, it like th- that's that's one of the key, uh, I think, traps of science too. really, you know, like you can like it, just think of a molecule, for instance, you know, like you can write down what a molecule looks like, but molecules are 3D. So that's not what a molecule looks like, you know. And also, like, you've got this molecule and it's like, and this arm's going out here, but you can also bend it this way. And it's the same molecule, but, you know, if it's right-armed or left-armed, it, it changes the way, like, it, it affects everything. So I think, like, you know, that's, that's one of the uh, traps of science is that if you try to, like, quantify everything, then you're missing something. You're going to miss something, you know? Like I, like I, 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 I wouldn't presume to understand like, you know, uh, quantum science or anything, but I know enough about like Everett Wheeler and the, uh, you know, the multiple worlds hypothesis and, uh, uh, you know, uh, things definitely aren't as they appear. Reality is not as it appears. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that so many, uh, you know, like, is it a coincidence that so many conscious, uh, consciousness researchers 
uh, and and uh, physicists and and quantum mechanics end up like becoming mystics? I don't think it is. I think you know uh, w- once you realize, oh wait, everything's buzzing, everything's vibrating. I just can't see it because I would go crazy if I saw and heard everything. You know. Uh, so yeah, for for me, like I don't know as far as the the alien and the the you, I, I definitely I definitely uh think that there may be a connection between the uh ufos uap i guess is the new politically correct term uh uh and and ets i don't know there there may be but uh i'm also uh like as 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 far as i know you know like uh maybe they just exist on on some mental level but once again like that's not that's not any less real to me like if if you don't have any matter, if you're if you're just like uh, an idea form, you know, um, like that's that's like the idea of a like you know a, a tulpa in Tibetan in Tibetan Buddhism, like you know when when you create an idea and oh, th- that's basically what a meme is though too, you know, for that matter, like you know memes. Uh, th- that's like in the Dawkins sense anyways, like, you know, cultures made up of memes and tropes and these, uh, you know, images and glyphs. And, and so, yeah, whether or not like they're extraterrestrial or hyperdimensional or just constructs and archetypes, like they, I don't think like one has more or less power necessarily. Like, you know, it, it, if they're, uh discorporate or or corporate like i don't know i don't know i uh i i I don't even know like for me it's 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 not like a huge deal but i think part of that is because like uh i don't know i i I don't i don't think uh i don't think all the mysteries are going to be unraveled in this life necessarily per se Phil, I I love what you just said about TART and the reality coping mechanism that you bring, because part of what we're doing and part of what kind of drew me to your work is there's something about truth and the systematic pursuit of truth, the unflinching pursuit of truth that I think does bolster our spirits a little bit it allows us to sort yeah, through absolutely. what's real and what's not so the, the, i, I the search the yes. search alone it's like it's, it's like the pursuit of happiness like that's where the happiness is at the happiness is in the pursuit of it you know what happens if you catch happiness well i don't know you better let it go else what do you have to pursue now <laughs> so what what are you pursuing now what, what's going on in in your world and, and what's coming um, up for you uh, you know, um, uh, I, I haven't I haven't announced what the next uh, uh, project that I'm currently working on is. I'm still waiting for the second book uh, edits to be finished. And you know, speaking of edits, I wasn't able to get the uh, Pedogate primer was not professionally edited. I had to proofread that myself. And there are some uh, uh, some grammar and typo issues that I'm hopefully going to get fixed soon. Uh, but yeah, by next year, I hope to have, uh, at, uh, at least two, uh, full length books should be coming out. Uh, the, the one that you mentioned, the deep state, uh, penetrating the veils of the unelected shadow government, uh, and, and another project that I've been working on for a little over a year now, and, um, I'm going to be real coy, uh, and, and not give anything away while also get, I, I, I give you, I'll give you a big hint, but at the same time, it gives nothing away. It has to do with Dr. Morris West, which really narrows it down. So it could be about Jonestown or JFK or McVeigh or Scientology or Charles Manson or, you know, who knows, MK Ultra or whatever. But it's, it's going to have something to do with, uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. West. Uh, like I said, I've I've gotten some of his papers from the uh, library special collection there. Luckily able to like digitize it and send it to me. I had to wait like a few weeks or whatever because they give, you know, UCLA staff and students obviously get first dibs. And if you're not, then you just have to wait a few weeks or a month and a half or whatever. And uh, then they said in another month, which is like two or three weeks from now, I should be able to uh, request some more. 
and then I'll be able to wait three or four more weeks. But no, I'm going to be stacking Morris West documents over the next uh, few months. That's uh, that's definitely a big part of it. I've got uh, uh, so, some interviews uh, like the 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 first book, you know, the first book and the uh, the the second one, the the deep state book. Both of them are very similar, and, and they take a very like uh, wide approach. You know, it's just a survey. It's like uh, just showing all these different things and like, you know, they're all kind of somewhat connected to kind of give you this, you know, wide angle view of things. Uh, but on the project that I'm working on right now that I'm doing the research and note taking and interviewing uh, process of now, um, this is going to be a deep dive, like, uh, which, you know, I think both are equally important, just depending you know, depending on, because uh, once again, depending on on the angle that you look at something from, you know, uh, the 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 observer and the observed, it's it's you know, uh, like that that right there. By the way, you know that kind of thing. That's 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 poetry to me. That's transcendental. You know, uh, uh, it's uh, and 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 I also agree with you. By the way, there is something. Uh, in the search for truth and not just happiness, but in the search for, you know, truth and meaning. Cause that's, you know, I, I personally believe that like, you know, hedonism will only get you so far. Um, maybe some folks, uh, I definitely folks are built different and you know, your mileage may vary, but, but, you know, for my money's worth, I think, I think that we all get more out of reality if, you know, if we sh- kind and and once again uh like the idea of you know everybody who wants a revolution you know like you realize like revolutions they often have very similar endings you know it's it's like the who song meet the new boss he's the same as the old boss uh so until we're able to like you know figure out what's going on in here and in here that's that you know that's the only chance we have for any real meaningful revolution or change is is when we're able to change ourselves uh and change our immediate surroundings and environment you know uh make the world a little better around you and and hope that trickles down i guess yeah i guess trickle down is all we can hope for but <laughs> we're all trickling down into each other and and I, i've really benefited a lot from the stuff that you've done that's trickled down my way. And I, I hope people check out your website. You have some, you're a great writer. You really are. And you really bring oh, a, a lightness to it, and, and, but get all the facts out there. So yeah. It, yeah. That, I mean, like I talk about a lot of uh, deep and dark subjects and, you know, at the same time, I, I don't think people are able to like swear it with me. You know, when I was doing the, the higher side chats, I saw some people are like, you know, like is, is, he, is he taking this stuff as a joke or something like no i've got kind of a supercilious expression half the time because if i didn't i would go crazy you know like honestly like i make light of things uh you know because things are so heavy you know things are really heavy and that's no reason to let yourself get dragged down by them you know that's another thing that you know i i always try and mention you know um one of one of the tricks of of you know uh, the powers that be or however you want to describe them is demoralization and depression. You know, because uh, you're not going to be on top of things. You're not going to change anything in your own life or outside of your own life if you're demoralized and depressed. And it's easy to get that way when when you see like, oh wow, well, it looks like you know. But no, I, I I don't buy the fact that like evil is in charge. No, I just don't buy it. I just don't feel it. I don't believe it's true. I could be wrong, you know. And if I am wrong, well, you know, I'm I'm glad that I'm wrong because I'm gonna have a better life, not believing that evil is in charge and being frozen with fear or indecision as a result. So yeah. Wow, that's really pretty deep. I think uh, uh, that's very profound. Uh, and I agree with you. I think the evidence suggests the opposite, is that mm. the light is in charge and the good yeah. is in charge. And it's 
a million times brighter and stronger than the dark. And that's why the dark, you know, th th thrashes around and does all this stuff and plays all this game because right. it's the only attention they're going to get. Like a, like a temper tantrum, yeah. That's right. <laughs> and in the stillness of our heart, when we wade out into the ocean, I'm going to go into the ocean later on today, and you wade out there a little bit and you look at the immensity of it and how mm. small you are and yet how yeah. God still penetrates through all that immensity and reaches you yep. that's that's magic and the rest yeah. of this stuff that they're calling magic is just tricks right absolutely yeah 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 basically parlor tricks yeah <laughs> so awesome man thank you for taking so much time with me i'm super interested in the jolly book so let me know when that comes oh, out yeah i can't wait to share it with you and i'll see you on the union Oh, definitely. Hope so. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Thanks again, by the way. I appreciate it. Thanks again to Philip Fairbanks for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I tee up from this interview is, what are we to make of our government's involvement in the scariest, darkest, evil stuff that they have been exposed now to be a part of openly. We all do this all along. There's a new little expose out on the CIA and sex trafficking kids as part of their intelligence gathering. I mean, that's just, we do it, but it's just, we can't really, really, really get there from here. You know, land of the free, home of the brave. And oh, let me procure a two-year-old boy for you. Let me procure a six-year-old girl for you in the hopes that I get some information. We, we, I don't know. I mean, I can't process that. I don't know how that fits together. Maybe you do. And that's, I guess, the question to tee up from this interview is how do we wrap our head around that? Let me know your thoughts. It's not always dark, but as Phil does a great job of pointing out in this interview, when it is, we have to face it and find a way through it without getting demoralized, without getting depressed, with a way of continuing to pursue the light. At least that's what seems to make the most sense to me. Until next time, take care and bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>